We are again going to spend some time in Psalm 104, so the, the fact that the board says that is not a mistake. We, are, uh, we did our basic overview last week, but there's some leftover items that I wanted us to talk about today. Uh, so maybe it would be wise for us to read again the psalm in its entirety, and then we'll begin to work our way uh, through the outline. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. He makes the winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. He established the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter forever and ever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they hurried away. The mountains rose. The valley sank down to the place which you established for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass over so that they will not return to cover the earth. He sends forth springs in the valleys. They flow between the mountains. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They lift up their voices among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of his works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine which makes man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil and food which sustains man's heart. The trees of the Lord drink their fill, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted, where the birds build their nests, and the stork whose home is the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the cliffs are a refuge for the Shephanim. He made the moon for the seasons, the sun knows the place of its setting. You appoint darkness and it becomes night, in which all the beasts of the forest prowl about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. Man goes forth to his work and his labor until evening. O oh Lord, how many are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number, animals both small and great. There the ships move along, and Leviathan, which you have formed a sport in it. They all wait for you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it up. You open your hand, they are satisfied with good. You hide your face, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. Let the Lord be glad in his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Let my meditation be pleasing to him. As for me, I shall be glad in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. How good to read this beautiful psalm together again. If uh, you weren't with us last week, I think there's still some copies of last uh, the handout and the visual outline chart. But uh, on today's handout, there's a, a few points of review I want us to look at. You'll remember letter A, or, well, n- number one, that this is a song of praise from the individual. This is primarily a praise psalm. Uh, This is a song of praise from the individual, and the focus is on God's creative power. This is, in the Psalms, the longest meditation on God's creative work. We don't know who the author is. It's believed that it might have been written during the exile. It is curious that in 35 verses, there's not a single reference to the temple or the the altar or sacrifice. And that leads some to think that uh, perhaps this was written during that period. And, and also, the, the very last word in the Hebrew text at the end of verse 35 is hallelujah. And that term 
only shows up in uh, the other places are all later psalms. They're all anonymous psalms. And the thought is that that's a word that was sort of coined in Hebrew as the centuries went on and there had been uh, <coughs> worship taking place in different settings for some time. Letter C, the psalmist muses on Yahweh's great glory evidenced in creation, a work which he not only executed magnificently, but which he maintained sovereignly. His preservation motivates the psalmist's praise and creates a yearning for cleansing in the world of humanity. I noted last week with you that as beautiful as the creation is, it does have its problems, doesn't it? We're not talking about the Garden of Eden. Uh, you know, as you get to about the two-third mark in the psalm, there's animals predating on others. Uh, and, and they're provided for by God, but this is not Eden. And then at the very end of the psalm, uh, there's a reference to sinners. The first reference to moral evil. And it's a great problem in the creation. In fact, it's the root of all the problems within creation. So there's, it ends with this note of the creation needs to be set aright. Uh, the problem of man's sin has to be dealt with. All right, so what I want to focus on today is some ways that Psalm 104 has been used in worship. And we're going to take a little ride through history as well as into the New Testament where Psalm 104 is quoted. The first part there in your notes it says we're talking about early uses. And uh, we're going to talk about how maybe the psalm was sung, and this is a little bit of conjecture, but th- I don't know if you noticed in our reading again that the, the psalm alternates between sometimes talking directly to Yahweh and sometimes talking about Yahweh. And it's kind of unpredictable. There's you, you do this, he, 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 you, and it kind of alternates uh, unpredictably. And uh, some uh, scholars have supposed that maybe these would be cues for different musicians. Maybe that the song, song would be sung in parts, that one voice would sing uh, certain verses and another would sing the others. That, that's possible. That would be a, an early use of the song. Uh, when, when the temple was b- rebuilt in the 400s uh, BC, this song would naturally have found a place into the repertoire of public worship. Even though it's a song of the individual, all of the psalms came to be used in public worship. In fact, as the centuries went on even more, number three, it became the custom on the morning of Yom Kippur, which is uh, the day of what? What's, the, what's that referred to? That's the day of atonement. Uh, the custom uh, on Yom Kippur, not the day of atonement, <laughs> the day of atonement, uh, was customary to recite the entire psalm because of its talk about how new life was emerging in response to God's grace. Remember back in verse 30, uh, it said that, you know, you, uh, you send your spirit, you send forth your spirit, they are created. You, you renew the face of the ground. There's death, uh, there's decay, but God is still involved in the world. And so that was taken kind of metaphorically for what God does in forgiveness, that there's death and judgment, but God is still gracious. So uh, that was one of the Jewish traditions that later traditions that was uh, evolved in using Psalm 104. And even later in Judaism, verse 4, let's look at verse 4 together. He makes the winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. It became customary in synagogue services that every Friday night and every Saturday morning during the winter months, that verse would be recited in prayer. Uh, in anticipation how God was going to re- renew life when uh, the spring came. God was going to blow, you know, he was going to send uh, a new life through the wind, as it were, and make things new. Uh, and then every new moon, too, verse 4, and, and Psalm 104 is recited uh, in later Judaism. So that's, that's quite interesting. This song resonated with ancient people that they found different ways to put it into their into their calendar. Go with me to the second page and we'll talk about some historical Christian uses. And when I say historical here, I'm, we're looking at the, the, the long scope of uh, church history. Uh, we're going to talk about groups that are very different from us here, like the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Uh, Psalm 104 is chanted every Sunday evening. Uh, for Vespers, which is a sort of an evening tide 
service before the candles are lit as darkness descends on the land. And the thought is that God is in charge of creation, night is coming, but day will come. That's a very, very old tradition in Eastern Orthodoxy. And then in Catholicism, of course, they have scheduled readings through different portions of Scripture. When you come in the Easter time, there's, I think, four different times during those periods of weeks where Psalm 104 has been recited. And a little bit closer to home to us, uh, there is a hymn that is based on Psalm 104. Now, the original version of it was in 1561 by William Keith, he, and what he did was paraphrase Psalm 104. It was published in the Anglo-Genevan Psalter. And then that text was uh, modified by the hymn by Robert Grant in 1833, O worship the, what goes in the blank? King, and there we go, yes. O worship the king is a hymn paraphrase of Psalm 104. Now, you all remember this hymn? I, I, I know I remember this hymn. We sing it periodically. Uh, now, there's been a little bit of changes uh, to it from when it's originally written. Um, and and it, the hymn focuses mostly on verses 1 to 6 and then sort of summarizes the rest of it. And then the original third stanzas and sixth stanzas are not in our hymnal. So I've printed out for you here uh, the, the whole text of it. And verse 1 will sound familiar. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. So pavilioned in splendor, he's housed in glory. That's kind of the language of verses 1 and 2. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak. And then verse 2 in the hymn, O tell of his might, O sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space. His chariots of wrath the deep thunderclouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. And that is a poetic paraphrase of verse 3. Uh, well, actually, verses 2 and 3. Um, stretching, uh, covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain, lays the beams of his upper chambers on the waters, makes the clouds his chariot, walks upon the wings of the wind. Uh, then look at verse uh, 3 of the hymn. The earth with its store of wonders untold, Almighty thy power hath founded of old, established it fast by a changeless decree, and round it hath cast like a mantle the sea. So there is, that's paraphrasing verses 5 through 9, how God has separated the land and the sea and made them distinct and that there's a forever distinction between them. Verse 4 is uh, a verse we have in our hymnal, in the hy that is the hymnal, hymn verse 4. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. So that's the, reminds you of verse 10, doesn't it? He sends forth springs in the valleys, they flow between the mountains, they give drink to every beast of the field, the wild donkeys, and so forth. Verse 5 in the hymn, Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. And that line, those lines just loosely summarize the intent of the psalm. And then the last stanza of the hymn, O measureless might, ineffable love, while angels delight to worship thee above, the humbler creation, though feeble there lies, lays, with true adoration shall all sing thy praise. The reference there to angels is uh, tying in with verse 4. Uh, I want you to look back with me in, the, in Psalm 104, verse 4. He makes the winds his messengers. The, the Hebrew text, the word messengers, is the same as the word angels. And in fact, that's going to tie us into the, the rest of our study. Uh, are there angels here in Psalm 104? This psalm which focuses on the physical creation might have some reference to uh, angels as well. All right, now let's go to the third page, and uh, we'll talk about how Psalm 104 is used in the New Testament. Uh, there are about a dozen times that the New Testament either quotes from, or more often it alludes to uh, this passage, and we're going to briefly take a look at these together. 
uh, Paul preaches a sermon in Acts 14, verses 15 to 17. Now, he doesn't tell us here, and thus says the 104th Psalm, uh, but the things he says in this sermon, Acts 14, verses 15 to 17, certainly echo the ideas we have. Verse 15, and saying, uh, let's back up uh, to verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go to their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So particularly there in verse 17, that's an allusion to the, the talk in the psalm about how he gives rain and it produces crops and it helps agriculture and mankind is benefited. By the, the, the verse that is quoted back in uh, verse 15 uh, is actually from a, uh, a different passage. That's, um, I, didn't, I didn't mark it down. But, uh, so there's an allusion to Psalm 104. Um, flip forward to 1 Timothy 6, verse 16. As Paul is concluding his first letter to Timothy, he uh, kind of breaks out into a doxology as he's prone to do at times. 1 Timothy 6. Let's back up to verse 13. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. That line right there in uh, verse 16, who dwells in unapproachable light, echoes the idea of Psalm 104 verse 2, that the Lord clothes himself with light as a garment. It's not a direct quote, but an allusion to it. Uh, the next three I don't think I'll have us look through. They're similar to these. They're references to how God preserves the creation. Jesus um, makes statements about how the Lord preserves the, his creation. You can see it in Matthew 13 and Matthew 24 and Matthew 5 and 6. These are kind of faint allusions to Psalm 104. But there is one direct quotation for sure and it's in the book of Hebrews and let's let's turn to that now we'll, the rest of our time is going to be focused on this Hebrews chapter 1 and we're spending a little we're going to spend a little time on this because this might bother you maybe you're reading in your devotions sometime soon or sometime recently and you you remembered this verse in Hebrews 1 and you think to yourself well, that doesn't sound like Psalm 104, and yet it is Psalm 104. Hebrews 1, verse 7, And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Now that reads similarly, doesn't it? But it sounds a little different too, doesn't it? Now, the, the, uh, the context is what we're going to bring up next. We're going to talk about the context of Hebrews 1, verse 7. Uh, and let me, before we go over what you have printed in your handout, remember that the whole purpose of Hebrews, this is a letter written to Hebrew Christians who are tempted to switch back to Judaism, probably because Roman persecution was mounting against Christians, and in that period, maybe this is the 60s A.D., Jews were pretty much left alone. Christians were getting antagonized. So if you're a Jewish Christian, you guess what? You feel like you've got a choice. I can kind of play up my Jewishness and maybe, maybe play down my Christianness 
and avoid some of this persecution. And the, and the whole letter is written to them to say, you can't do that. Because to, to play down your Christianness means to play down Christ, to make him something lesser. And maybe one of the temptations was that they found a new place in their thinking for Christ that, well, maybe he was an angel. Uh, I mean, he was great and all, but maybe, you know, if we, if we stop saying he's Lord and come up with some other category for him. So one of the first things that the book of Hebrews says is Jesus is greater than angels. Um, to your notes there, uh, number one, in Hebrews 1, verses 7 and 9, Jesus is presented as the one enthroned in heaven, high above all men and angels. And verse 7 in the Greek text begins with a particle that's roughly equivalent to on the one hand, and then when you get to verse 8, it, it shows up again, which would mean on the other hand. So uh, let's, let's back up in Hebrews 1 and get a feel for all of this context again. Uh, Hebrews 1, verse 1, God after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purifications of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. He says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. On the other hand, of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they all will become old like a garment, and they will, like a mantle, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? So without going into a lot of exposition here, you can see there's a big contrast. The Son is right there with the Father. The Son was there in creation. The Son is Lord over everything. There are things which from the Old Testament could be said of angels, and there's much more glorious things that are said about the Son. Jesus is greater than angels. While angels are on the go, number two, the Son is on the throne. That's the big contrast that Hebrews 1 sets up. Now, having said all that, we come back to verse 7 where we are faced with a difference in our translations. Look at, uh, you can see it, I've printed it in your handout, how the New American Standard translates Hebrews 1.7 of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Now, let, go back to, to Psalm 104, verse 4, and look at that now. He makes the winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. So the New American Standard has not used the word angels here, and, and I'm not make, saying anything critical about the New American Standard here. I'm just, we're just observing how in Psalm 104, uh, the way this text reads, it's the winds are God's messengers. But here in Hebrews 1, it sounds like that the angels are turned into winds. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the Greek text that the book of Hebrews is used, the, the book of Hebrews is quoting from 
the Old Testament, but it's quoting from a translation of the Old Testament, an ancient translation called the Septuagint. The Septuagint. And actually, I was talking with some purists who told me that you're actually, wouldn't you believe this? You're supposed to say it this way, Septuagint. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> no, none of us are ever going to get that right. <laughs> so, uh, the Septuagint. Uh, it's a, it's a, there's a third way of saying it. <laughs> it's an ancient translation of the Old Testament. It was translated before the time of Christ. Uh, it took a long time for it to be completed. Um, Psalm 104, you know, what, what the, the, the Septuagint is generally not a fancy translation. Many times it's just word for word. Here's a Hebrew word, here's a Greek word. Hebrew word, Greek word. He, and regardless of what the grammar is, that's exactly what happens here in Psalm 104. It's almost a transliteration, or it's almost a, um, what do you call those kind of, uh, Pastor Red, what do you call those, par- those translations where, uh, an interlinear, it's almost like an interlinear. Uh, so, uh, the Hebrew text back in Psalm 104 is kind of grammatically ambiguous. You know, depending on what the context is of those words, you could come up with several different translations. And here's why, because the word messengers is exactly the same word as angels. That's what the word angel means. It means messenger. And sometimes it's a human messenger, and sometimes it's a spiritual messenger. It it completely depends on the context. You know, the same thing is true with the Greek word, angelos, angel. It's exactly the same thing. So, like in Revelation chapter 2, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? You know, that might mean to the messenger of the church of Ephesus. Um, So, that's an issue. And then there's the word winds. In Hebrew, the word wind can also mean spirit. Same thing in Greek as well. Um, So, there's some ambiguity there. And then also, the word order can be switched around, both in the Hebrew text as well as the Greek text. It could be translated, he makes the winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. That's what the New American Standard did in Psalm 104. Or you could render it, he makes his angels into winds, his ministers into flaming fire. Or how about this one? He makes his angels into spirits, his ministers into flaming fire. So there's some ambiguity here, isn't it? Some interesting uh, possibilities. And this ambiguity was not lost on ancient people. Um, in the synagogues and the like, this verse was understood sometimes in very different ways. Uh, and it led to some sometimes speculations about uh, what was going on here. Flip over to the back page. Uh, it, the problem is that Psalm 104 seems to be talking about physical winds in nature. It's a nature psalm. Um, it seems to be talking about physical winds, whereas Hebrew one, Hebrews 1 is clearly talking about spiritual angelic beings. Some ancient rabbis were confused about Psalm 104. In fact, there were some legends that developed based on verse 4 that said that God would send out angels and um, when they came back, they were turned into flames of fire after they came back from their missions. So that's how they understood Psalm 104 verse 4. God sends out the angelic messenger, he comes back, and poof, he's just sitting there burning like a candle until he goes back out again. Now, I think that's kind of misreading what's going on <laughs> in Psalm 104. And here now, I get to share something humorous with you, and I actually meant to share this with you at the beginning. You see that green box? Um, here's a, a modern song about angels that has been misunderstood, and this ties in with Christmas. Hark the herald angels sing. These are all recorded ways that children have misunderstood those words. Some thought it was honk, the herald angels sing. Or hark, the hair-lipped angels sing. Peace on earth and mercy mild, gold and silver make us smile. (laughs) God and sinners wreck a child. (laughs) God God and sinners wrecked in style. (laughs) With a jelly coat proclaim, <laughs> I don't know what a jelly coat is, uh, but, and then also, and the jelly post proclaim. These are all ways that this song about angels has been misheard. I, I point that out to say Psalm 104 in Judaism was sometimes misheard or misread, misunderstood, and there were legends about what happened to angels that were uh, spun off of the wording of verse 4. 
So here's what I think is a good way to understand what's happening in the way that the book of Hebrews is quoting this. Uh, I'm, I'll give you my own translation of verse 7, and it would be this. And of the angels, he says, who makes the winds his angels and a flame of fire his ministers. Now, the, the advantage to this translation is that it doesn't change the meaning of Psalm 104. Uh, if, you, if you go with the way that the New American Standard has translated Hebrews 1, verse 7, it totally understands the verse in a different way. You know, that, uh, that uh, whereas this is still fits with the idea that these are natural things. The notion is that God is able to use all sort of created things to accomplish his bidding, whether they're living things or not. God can command the wind to go, and that's just like sending a messenger. He has angels as messengers and servants, but he can also use wind and fire to deliver his messages. You know, when God sends a great storm at Mount Sinai and the earth is shaking and trembling and burning, I think that kind of signifies that God's doing something, doesn't it? In fact, there are many times in the Old Testament where God sends great winds that send a message, uh, an inaudible message. How about in the book of Jonah? Jonah is on the run, and he thinks he can escape uh, God's call, and one of the first things that Yahweh does is he casts a great wind into the sea, and everything ends up in turmoil. God sent the wind, made the wind his messenger in that case. So the point then in Hebrews 1 would be angels to us, they're really great and powerful, but in God's eyes, they're not much different than the wind. <laughs> I mean, uh, God, God sends a, a spirit being just as easily He sends the wind, uh, whereas the Son, God's Son is not like that. God's Son is supreme and superior. Yes, God sent His Son but he did not send him in the same way that he sends out messengers. Yes, the Son is the Word, the message of God, but it's on a totally different level than angelic beings. So what's true of angels is not true of the Son. The wind and the fire are not like him because God's sending of his Son was something that was utterly unique. And that's one of the big arguments of the book of Hebrews is the great uniqueness of the Son. Yes, he was sent, but not just as an angel. Uh, angels don't sit on thrones in heaven. Uh, angels don't accomplish redemption. Only the Son of God does that. Jesus, the Son sent from heaven, is not like angels sent on mission who blow in and out as God ordains. The Son's special mission is now over and he sits enthroned. He sat down at the Father's right hand. So this is a way of dealing with uh, uh, what seems like a, a difference of understanding between the way these words are used in Hebrews back and also in Psalm 104. So I think we should keep Psalm 104, verse 4, reading very much like it does. Uh, he makes the winds, you could say, he makes the winds his angels flaming fire his ministers. He, he sends out things in the physical world to send messages, just like he sends angelic beings to do that. And I think that same translation works fine here in Hebrews 1. All right. Did you get all that? Now, someone asked why are there separate chairs on, uh, on the sides here, and that's because there's going to be a quiz now, and the proctors will sit there. No. Uh, <laughs> So, but did you have any, any, any questions about this whirlwind tour we just did through uh, Psalm 104 and Hebrews 1? So, I'll, I'll remind you that uh, next week there's no class. It's Christmas Sunday, so we'll be canceling our classes. And then on January 1st, there's no class because that's New Year's Day. So the class will next meet on January 8th, and I, Pastor Ed will be uh, beginning a, a new series. And, and you want to keep it a secret at this point? He's going to keep it a secret, yeah. Okay, great. All right, let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the time we've had to journey through the Testaments and see how this very rich portion of Scripture has impacted uh, your people, both in New Testament times and down through the ages. 
it is beautiful. It speaks of your creative power. We thank you, Lord, that you do sustain us every single day. You've established this world so that it, it uh, runs and seems as if it maintains itself, but really you're the one who upholds it, and you uphold us, and you have a plan to bring about a new creation, a new heaven, a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Thank you for making us part of that new beginning and creating a new creation within us. Now, Lord, as we prepare for the, uh, the rest of this morning and the special program to follow, we, uh, we pray that you would be pleased and praised and much good would come to us. And as we continue in this Christmas season, that we would reflect on the greatest thing you've ever sent, which is your Son, the Son who sits enthroned above. In Jesus' name, amen.